Vampires. We all love these little bitey guys that want all of that alive juice running through our necks that we call blood. But there's so many kinds of vampires, where do you even get started? How do you know which type of vampire is right for you and your family in 2023? That's where I come in. We're going to be looking at all the best kinds of vampires. We're going to pick the best ones, objectively, using vampire science. <laughs> Good evening, scaredy cats, my creatures of the night, what sweet music you make. It's October, the spooky month, and we have a yearly tradition around here at Scaredy Cats LLC, a subsidiary of Bobby Duke Industries, where in October, we temporarily shift our focus away from horror media, which nobody cares about this close to Halloween, and towards spooky media, a distinction so clear, I have never and will never feel the need to explain it. And what could be spookier than the common American vampire, that prototypical Halloween monster? It's time we talked about vampires for once. Sure, we've discussed a vampire on a plane, or a vampire on a menopause, even a vampire on a 60s once or twice. But we've never had the courage, nay, the heroism to ask, what are the best vampires? So, I have collected an elite assortment of the best sucky boys, which we will analyze in an attempt to sort the Draculas from the Waculas. Each vampire will be sorted from best to worst according to the three principles that I think define what makes a good vamp. Number one, spook factor. Am I afraid of this vampire? Do I fear that it will suck my blood? Number two, horniness factor. Do I feel horny about this vampire and or reasonably confident that this vampire would feel horny about me? And third, this one's kind of a catch-all, just, you know, vibes, vampy vibes. Like, how well does this particular vampire utilize vampire lore, if at all? Does it do anything interesting with the vampire rules? In general, does it feel kind of, you know, like, like vampire-y? Before I begin, it's important for me to clearly define what a vampire is in order to avoid needless arguments in the comment section. So, in order to be considered on this list, the subject must be an immortal, undead being that is compelled to drink the blood of the living. If you don't have these three qualities, I'm sorry, you're a pseudo-vamp at best. That means I don't want to hear about no I am legend. Those are not undead creatures, they're suffering from a disease, but they're very much alive. No Count Von Count, he merely resembles a vampire, but does not possess any of the requisite qualities. No Count Chocula, he does not drink blood, he eats a pretty disgusting cereal, and most importantly, no fucking Morbius. You're not a vampire, Morbius. A living vampire is a contradiction of terms, Morbius. I don't want to hear about Kronos or Martin. I get it. You, you thought you had an obscure vampire, that's fine. Also, to be extra clear, we're ranking types of vampire here, not individual vampires. Otherwise, like Dracula, obviously. Dracula is the best vampire. That's obvious. I, I don't need to tell you that. And we're not ranking the quality of the media the vampire is within. We're talking about vampire quality here, everybody. Let's try and stay focused. Okay, now that we're all on the same page and argument is impossible, let us begin with the obvious. Dracula. Now this might be confusing, because I did just say we wouldn't do this, but like, there's so many Draculas that I think we do have to kind of consider him a category of a vampire. You can't talk vamps without talking Drax. He's the main guy of vampires. So my man is going to score high right off the bat, pun intended. You got your Dracula, Bram Stoker's Dracula, the movie titled Bram Stoker's Dracula, Hammer Dracula, Dracula on a boat, Dracula but 20 years ago, Dracula but now. You get it. I've said this a million times. Dracula does not make me horny. Now, sure, there's a sexy Dracula here and there. You know, sometimes it's Gerard Butler, but I think we can agree this is not Dracula's greatest strength, nor do I find Dracula particularly scary. Though I did once see Dracula during a night terror, and that was pretty scary, I guess, but in general, no, I am not scared of Dracula. However, in terms of vibes, Dracula is unparalleled. He is the template against which every subsequent vampire's vibe is to be judged. He blows out the scale. And on the strength of that alone, I must obviously place him in the O-positive tier. It's the best kind of blood, so it's, it's the top tier. It simply goes without saying that Dracula is a fine vampire indeed. Dracula, but silly. Yeah, I'm starting this list with two discrete types of Dracula. You have your serious Dracula, you know, your attempt to adapt or translate the character into a real world setting for spooks and or chills. And you have your silly pop culture Draculas, your dead and loving it's, your Hotel Transylvanias, your Castlevanias, but not the ones where Dracula is serious, your monster mashes and other such various graveyard smashes. Now these Draculas are gonna score even lower in terms of scare factor, but oddly enough can sometimes score highly in horniness. And while their vibes are far less impressive than their 
serious counterparts, still nothing to sneeze at over here, resting at peace comfortably in the coffin tier. Lestats. Like it or not, I think we can make a pretty solid argument that Anne Rice's Vampire Chronicles are second only to Dracula in terms of vampirical cultural impact. Her books might not be your cup of blood, but one simply cannot deny the quality of vampire on display within. Horniness? Off the charts. I can say with confidence that not only would everyone watching this fuck Lestat and all of his pals, but Lestat and his pals would also fuck everyone watching this. Scare factor? Nominal. They're certainly a threat, but nothing to write home about. I would be scared to see one, but they don't keep me up at night thinking about. And vibes? They're great. They feel like vamps. These are some vamps. You cannot deny you got a, a bunch of vampires running around in these books. I must put them in the A positive tier, not A plus. A positive. Nosferatu's. Now, I'm talking about the category of Nosferatu, not specifically referring to Count Orlok, the titular Nosferatu, from the film Nosferatu, A Symphony of Horror here. Nosferatu's are, as far as I'm concerned, a genus of vampire, thereby including, for example, Max Schreck from Shadow of the Vampire, and the Master from Jacob's Wife, and that spooky guy in the window from Salem's Lot, and the Master from Buffy the Vampire Slayer. A lot of masters in this category. Now, Let's not beat around the bush. These vamps are unfuckable. Sorry to be the one to say it, but you know it's true. You do not want to have sex with an Osferatu. They look like a rat person. No thank you. Maybe once or twice, but no thank you. The vibes are typically on point though, but I think the real appeal of the Nosferatu is scare factor. The Nosferatu is, in my humble opinion, the scariest of all vampires. They have a scary face, which frightens me. It's a little weird that in the original Nosferatu film, everybody sees this guy and they're like, yeah, it's a normal guy, I guess. I don't know, seems like a monster guy to me, everybody. A positive tier. What we do in the shadows. The vampires in Taika Waititi's mockumentary What We Do in the Shadows and its spin-off television program score outstandingly high on both horniness and vibes. Their commitment to both of these categories is virtually unmatched in the modern era, and at first, their lack of a spook factor might seem like a detriment. But consider that this franchise is a comedy, and also that it has these guys in it, so it's even got that going for it, really. O positive, excellent work. Vampire Diaries and shit like that. Now, I don't know anything about Vampire Diaries, and I do refuse to learn. They are on this list strictly as a catch-all for the glut of by-the-numbers young adult vampire dramas that I don't feel a strong need to engage with because they are for teenage girls, except for Twilight, of course, which I will save to the end of this list because, let's be honest, that's probably why you're here. If you want to see people shitting on stuff made for teenage girls, I don't know what to tell you. The rest of the internet is there if you want that. I award them no points and refuse to consider them on this list. True Blood. Now look, True Blood just narrowly escapes being placed in that Vampire Diaries category. On its merits, though, I must concede that True Blood's vampires are very horny indeed. They have extremely vampiric vibes, and while they may lack spooks, that's kind of the point, I think, right? Like, that's the commentary of it. The metaphor would be somewhat undercut if I did get terribly spooked. So, I don't know. Bat tier. Lost Boys. Lost Boys are certainly scary because of their scary faces that they have sometimes, and their ability to get you to eat worms. Hey, Mildo, it's me, Bobby Duke, star of the channel. Uh, just wondering if I could uh, interject here real quick. No, Bobby, not at this time. Lost Boys also got some good vampy vibes. They feel like vamps. No complaints there. However, we run into issues when analyzing their horniness, because most of them are minors, and therefore I would like to not talk about this anymore, and I'm forced to award them zero points. Near Dark. I remind you now that we're here to take an objective look at vampire quality, not the quality of the media those vampires are found within. Near Dark has some scary vampires, I guess, but not really in the way we're looking for here. They're more scary in a, they, it's a guy with nothing to lose kind of way. And the vibes are confusing. The rules feel real loosey-goosey, and there is a certain lack of that classical vampire elegance, but it's not entirely missing the mark, I guess. And I, I don't think they're hot at all. So all in all, I think bat tier on this one. Sorry, everybody, I, I, this, this is an objective process. 30 days of night. On scares alone, these guys are doing pretty good. Sure, the vibes and horn factor are way off, but like, I don't want them to get me. They're too vaguely European. Is the movie any good? I don't know. I liked it when I saw it, but I don't want to rewatch it to find out in case it's bad. The vamps are memorable though, you can't deny that. They're so strong and they rip you up and they talk all weird. Remember that part where the, the one person's like, oh God, and the main vamp is like, no, no God. Yeah, you do, you do remember that. Do you remember much else? Probably not. I don't know, everyone says this movie is bad, but I remember really liking it. So who can say a positive tier? Blade. Don't. Don't start.
well, actually, Blade is not a vampire. He's a daywalker. He walks between worlds with all of their strengths and none of their weaknesses, save, of course, the thirst. Yeah, no shit. I know who Blade is. I went to primary school. I'm referring to the vampires in the Blade franchise of feature films, obviously. I am also aware of the intersection between Dracula and Blade. Let's not be pedants here. Can I just talk about Blade, please? Why does no one want me to talk about Blade? And across the board, I feel like these vamps are killing it, pun intended. But I am forced to deduct points based on the bad CGI in the first film. Also, I feel like the inclusion of super vampires in the second film undercuts the menace posed by normal, regular vampires. So I'm bumping them down to bat tier. Underworld. These are the plain, unsalted potato chip of the vampire world. The elements are all there, sure, but they're put together in such an unexciting and unsatisfying way. This is a franchise that somehow managed to make a war between leather-clad vampires dual-wielding pistols and big, burly werewolves boring. That shouldn't be possible. That's embarrassing. The only thing that keeps them out of the fang tier is that they are, of course, powerfully horny. Despite my distaste for these films, I cannot deny people are going to get horny about them. Dead tier. Carmilla. Perhaps the earliest popular example of vampires used to examine queer sexuality. Carmilla, the 1872 novella, actually predates Bram Stoker's Dracula, and therefore, the entire modern conception of what a vampire is meant to look like. So, to put that simply, vampires were gay before they were even vampires. Sapphic vampires in particular could be said to be their own subgenre. The idea of a vampire as a sort of barely restrained longing lends itself naturally to this type of framing, something considered unnatural against the expected order, but also undeniable, desirable, irrepressibly seductive. Something which grants a forbidden power one that authority figures, typically male, would prefer that you do not have. That being said, I have not read this novella, and most of its adaptions, not all, but most, are just sleazy softcore porns, so it puts me in an awkward position because on its historical merit, I do want to rank it higher, but I also don't want to talk about most versions of the character, so I am forced to award it no points. Fright Night. In Fright Night, one of the vampires looks like this. Oh, positive. Buffy the Vampire Slayer. A lot of vampires in this franchise, they are of course gonna vary in quality. The series' attitude towards vamps also gradually shifts from them being the primary antagonists and a serious, credible threat to them essentially being jobbers or comic relief. But in terms of horniness, there's something here for everybody. From your Spikes, to your Angels, to your Drusillas, to your Harmonies, to your Darlas, to your Shao Kahn's. They even got your Pee Wee Hermans. Those are the seven types of sexual partner. The vibes are also all over the place. Sometimes they're completely on point, but I also don't love the idea that somehow a vampire is at once a demon inhabiting a human corpse, but also simultaneously that person without a soul and therefore lacking moral inhibition. The latter works better narratively, but the former seems to be more in line with the show's mythology, so I don't know, it just doesn't feel like it makes a lot of sense. Like, why would the demon inhabit your body and have all of your memories and preferences? Scariness is going to vacillate wildly. Sometimes these vamps are a real threat anytime Angel lost his soul, that there was a palpable menace to that. But then also, sometimes it's just a little boy. I'm supposed to be scared of this little boy? And like, how come people can just kick vampire asses? Like, how come? Like, Buffy, I get. She's the once-in-a-generation chosen one who fights like a few vampires in one location, even though it's clearly established that there are fucking vampires everywhere. But how come like Xander, a character who is both implicitly and explicitly useless, is able to be dust in vamps left and right? Serious power creep going on with these vamps. For these reasons, I am forced to place Buffy vamps in the coffin tier. Some strong standouts, but mostly just goofy guys with admittedly cool prosthetics. Let the right one in. I'm now coming to realize the depth of error I made when designing this ranking system. Because the only vamp in this fucking movie is a minor, and there is some subtext in the movie which implies some sort of sexual abuse, and I can't and won't discuss it. I therefore award it no points. Blackula. Blackula, a franchise which exists primarily because of how funny its name is, has no business actually being good. You hear that name and you think it's just a goofy parody, but it's actually a pretty compelling horror drama that examines the day-to-day -day and historical trauma of the Black American experience. It opens with the main character seeking Dracula's help in ye olden times in ending the slave trade, but Dracula flatly refuses because Dracula is evil and thus likes evil things. He then turns protagonist Prince Mamuwalde into Blackula. If you had merely heard that synopsis and that title and haven't actually watched Blackula, let me just let me show you a little clip of William Marshall's performance. Just watch some of the acting he's doing. Dr. Thomas! 
Dr. Tova! Not one man can escape my vengeance! Not one man shall leave here alive! Search out every shadow! Every corner! This will be your inglorious tomb! That's a positive tier, I don't know what to tell you. Daybreakers. If everyone is vampires, no one is vampires. That's the premise of Daybreakers, a premise which is so dumb, executed with pitch-perfect pofe sincerity. They wring every drop of juice out of this extremely thin premise, and I cannot help but admire the chutzpah. The vans, however, you know, they're gonna range. It's everybody. It, everyone on Earth. Some of them are gonna be fuckable, sure, but most aren't. And they're not scary, except in, like, an allegorical sense. Like, it says something about the nature of consumption within a predatory economic structure, and that scares me in a sense, but, you know, it's not really what we're looking for. I do have to hand it to the vibes here, though, because they did do something interesting with vampire lore. They did do exactly one thing. Bat tier. From dusk till dawn. Hope you already watched that movie. There's vampires in it. Surprise. The horniness of this one is going to vary. Sometimes they look like weird monsters. Sometimes it's Selma Hayek putting her feet in your mouth. So are they scary? They look kind of scary, I guess, but they're also super easy to kill, so it's hard to say. Let's call that a draw. And in terms of vibe, Vibes are off, I'm sorry. These vamps do not feel particularly vampiric. Gotta go with Coffin Tear on this one. Vampire the Masquerade. I don't have time for this. There are so many goddamn types of vampire in this franchise. More types of vampire than there are grains of sand in every beach on Earth. Were I to list each and every one and attempt to do my due diligence on each, I could not finish before the heat death of the universe. Let's just put it in the middle. Probably has some good ones, probably has some bad ones. It just evens out. It's in the middle. Bat tier. Count Duckula. Don't. 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 Don't fucking start with me. Uh, excuse me, Count Dracula does not fake or stay to rules. He does not drink blood. He drinks tomato juice. You fool. You utter child. He comes from a line of vicious vampire Duckulas. And they do drink blood. He's the exception to that status quo. Blood drinking is clearly the normal way for vampires to function within this world. Sorry. I need to calm down. You know that I can get heated about Count Dracula. In any case, I think we can all agree. Count Dracula is not a sexual powerhouse. He's too soft, you know, kind of a pushover. Although he does seem like he'd be a generous lover. He does seem to care about others, and he's funny, and he does have a cool castle. You know what, I think I talked myself into it, actually. I think I do want to fuck Count Duckula a little bit. But he's not scary, I'll say that. Uh, I was quite scared of the theme song to his cartoon when I was a very young child. But otherwise, no, I don't, I don't think most people would be frightened by him. His vibes, though, are pretty on point. He is vampire as hell, he's got a little Dracula cape. You cannot deny him that. However, I am forced to deduct points for the aforementioned aversion to drinking blood. Therefore, I think Count Duckula, we gotta put him in the coffin tier. I'm not happy about it either. While we're on the subject of cute animal Draculas, Benicula. Yes, I know. Benicula does not drink blood. I know. I know that. He sucks the juice from vegetables, leaving them a ghostly white. One could argue, I suppose, that vegetable juice is vegetable blood. But in the traditional sense, no, Benicula does not drink blood. Is it entirely clear that Benicula is, in fact, a vampire? I don't know. It's ambiguous within the story. Do not presume to lecture me about Benicula. How dare you? The thing about this video is that I wrote this list and I will not give up a chance to discuss Benicula, my favorite book series as a child. I will not miss a chance to discuss the Benicula fun book, my fondest childhood memory, or read you some jokes from it. Why do vampires enjoy family reunions? Because they love to attack necks of kin. How did the vampire start his letter? Tomb it may concern. What kind of boats do vampires like best? Blood vessels. Why are vampires easily fooled? Because they're all suckers. Why does a vampire use mouthwash? Bat breath. Highest possible marks. O positive tier. Vampires, but like real ones. Oh, we talked about a lot of vampires already, but what about like vampires though? Like actual vampires in real life. And I, I don't mean in the sense that they are real, but in the sense that how people thought real vampires were, you know, like actual folklore vampires from olden times, not guys that think that they're vampires. That's a whole other thing. And these guys, who boy, they stink, often literally. No consistency when it comes to these vampires. Sometimes they're revenants who've come back from the dead for no reason. Sometimes they're an allegory for tuberculosis. Sometimes they're people who committed perjury or stepped in a puddle wrong. It's not scary. 
I mean, tuberculosis is actually kind of scary, but not in the, not, it's, but not allegories for it aren't. Allegories don't frighten me. They merely help me conceptualize difficult ideas. Are they elegant, immortal, blood-drinking seducers? No. Their corpses stumble fumbling around at night. You dig up somebody and their fingernails got longer or their gums recessed, making it look like they have fangs. Oh no, how scary, it's a vampire. And like, I'm not gonna fuck them. Nine times out of ten, there's some dead relative. That is literally the thing I want to fuck least in the world. Vampire tech has moved way beyond these relics. I am not a superstitious Eastern European peasant thang tier. Midnight Mass. These vamps combine the scariest aspect of vampires, that they want to kill you, and the scariest thing in real life, people who are way into Jesus. It's a brilliant subversion because normally, Vampires, at the very least, will not try to pressure you into going to church. They don't like to go there. Say what you will about vampires, but they do have that going for them. So scariness? Very good. Very high. Horniness, I'm afraid, will suffer. There is nothing less sexy than Catholicism. Vibes are a mixed bag. Sometimes they're real vampy, sometimes they're just that relative you don't want to talk to at Thanksgiving. Mixed bag. Bat tier. Jesus Christ, Vampire Hunter. The first of the deeply Canadian franchises on this list, Jesus Christ Vampire Hunter's meager efforts do not merit my consideration. I award them no points and only bring them up because I thought the existence of the movie itself is pretty funny. The Curse of Strahd. The Curse of Strahd is a popular D&D module where you fight not Dracula in his not Castlevania. Along the way, you encounter lots of classic monster movie pastiches and some highly regrettable ethnic stereotypes that Wizards of the Coast is desperate to make you forget about. It is impossible for me to judge these vampires impartially. I have simply lost too much to them, both in terms of party members and my own hit points. These fuckers deal damage to your maximum health. So you can't even heal after a fight from them until after a long rest. It is absolutely fucked. Also, Strahd himself has far too many adds, and he regains like 20 HP per round if he's not in direct sunlight or in running water. What the fuck? That's broken. Fang tier, get lost. Fuck these guys. Being human. I watched both the British and American version of this show, and I can't remember a damn thing about either of them. I could go investigate, but I think the fact that these two made so little impression on me says everything I need to know. Fang tier. Forever Night. Anyone who knows me personally knew this would have to come up at some point. Forever Night is a Canadian procedural drama, and this is gonna sound like a joke, but it's not. It's about a vampire homicide detective on the mean streets of Toronto who works the night shift because he can't do the day shift because he's a vampire, you get it. As a child, I was obsessed with this show, and I remain so as an adult. If you think you have heard the last of me discussing Forever Night on this channel, you could not be more wrong. It is difficult for me to be impartial because this show specifically, despite being dopey and hokey as shit when viewed from a modern lens, informed virtually my entire understanding of what coolness looked like when I was 11. For that reason, I am forced to place it in the A-positive tier, where it likely does not deserve to be, may God have mercy on my soul. Blood Rain. I have never played any of the Blood Rain video games, but I did see the highly regrettable film version directed by the notoriously bad filmmaker Uwe Boll. From what I remember, there's a lot of tight leather outfits, and I think there was a scene where Meatloaf was in it and he was a vampire and he was having an orgy. Uh, so I don't know. Coffin tier? Folklore from other countries that people just call vampires sometimes, even though they're clearly not vampires, it's a different thing from a different culture. If you've ever heard the claim that the vampire myth exists within all cultures, you probably know what I mean here. Whether it's the Chinese Zhangji, inappropriately sometimes called the Hopping Vampire, or the Malay Penang Gaul, anytime Westerners come across a spooky story of anything that might even hypothetically drink blood, we hoot and we holler and we call that one of our classic vampires. The vibes are simply atrocious here. They're not meant to be vampires and thus do not act like vampires. And since I didn't grow up in the cultural context they were created in, I do not find them scary and I certainly don't think there's anything all that horny about a woman's severed head and entrails trying to eat babies out of people's wombs. However, it also feels highly inappropriate to just label all mythological creatures from other cultures which resemble vampires inherently inferior to Western folklore, so let's just split the difference and say bat tier. Is that, is that fair? Jojo's Bizarre Adventure. Gonna be honest, I just put this one here because I didn't want to listen to people constantly telling me I should have. I have no intention of talking about it, now or ever. I award it no points. 
Twilight. Again, I must remind you, we are here to rank the quality of vampire, not quality of media that vampire exists within. We are neutral, scientific observers, except in the examples of Benicula and Forever Night, those I was highly biased towards. But for the purposes of this discussion, we are neutral, unbiased observers. And the vibes, they are bad, famously bad. These vamps do not feel like vamps. You have to admit that. They're walking around in the sun and playing baseball, and they're all vaguely kind of Mormon. You can't get much further from a vampire than that. And the mythology is just nonsense. They're made of crystals? Babies can become vampire in utero and claw themselves out of the womb, but also the babies are psychic and communicate with their mother and love you? Then why would they do that? That these vampires, in order to hide in plain sight, um, go to high school and they date high school students. Are you sure about that? You sure about that? You sure about that? That's why? However, let it not go unsaid. The hoardiness levels are without peer. No vampires have ever, ever in the history of humankind made people quite this horny. Presenting vampires as metaphors for both sides of the tension between sexual attraction and the Christian conservative fear of sex is kind of inspired. They're this impossibly beautiful creature that is dangerous to get too close to, something which pines for you forever but is afraid to ever act on that lest you become corrupted by them or hurt in the process. I also do have to hand it to them in terms of scares because while the execution is, let's say, muddled, some of the ideas it presents are genuinely scary. I've heard the whole vampires are sexy to lure in victims things a million times, but the much derided sparkly effect demonstrates this pretty well. They're like, glittering jewels. They appeal to something deep within us that we don't quite understand. And as much as I made fun of it, the idea of a vampire baby crawling out of the scratching and biting its way out of the womb, like that's, that is kind of scary. Gross and dumb, but scary. All in all, gonna have to rank them pretty high, I think. I'm gonna go with bat tier on this one, folks. The vibes are simply too bad to reasonably put them any higher than that. Now, before we crown the objectively best vampires, I'd like to discuss some honorable mentions that I'm not familiar with enough to rank or who I feel are disqualified for consideration for some reason. I've already mentioned Martin, I Am Legend, Kronos, and most unforgivably, Morbius. But we've also got Stakeland. Pretty sure these are just zombies that are kind of like vampires. But I also don't remember literally anything from this movie. I did watch it, but it left my mind completely unmarked by the phenomenon of memory. Subspecies also. I probably like this one. I do like full moon movies, but I have not watched it, I must confess. A girl walks home alone at night, got halfway through this one before my wife fell asleep, and now I exist in a quantum superposition of not being allowed to finish it without her and her not wanting to restart it, so I'll probably never know what happens in it. Dark Shadows? This one on historical relevance is pretty important, but I'd never watched it. I'm not a million years old, nor will I abide the antics of Johnny Depp. Legacy of Cain, never played it. Sorry. There's that time Batman became a vampire. And despite everything you know about me, I've, I've never read that, nor have I watched the cartoon where Batman fights Dracula. If I had to guess, I'd say I'd probably put that in the bat tier just for the wordplay. John Carpenter's Vampires, anyone who claims to have actually watched this movie is lying to you. Each DVD case of this movie is empty because nobody's ever bothered to check. There's Vamp, that one's on the to watch list, but I haven't watched it yet. So who are the best vampires? I have what I consider to be a pretty controversial choice, but I gotta give it to what we do in the shadows. They have a good mix of all of the qualities I'm looking for in a vampire in these trying modern times. The elegant, immortal, Byronic, brooding archetype. The consistent mythology that incorporates virtually any bit of vampire lore you can imagine without it ever feeling out of place. Some fun special effects creatures to give the vamp some variety, and even some good scares when the story calls for it. Like sure, the scares are there to serve the laughs, but it still works, it's still helping the story. They are, of course, horny to the point of parody, because it is a parody. That's just part of who they are, and it's treated like a mundane and expected part of their lives that they seldom even remark on. They're not just constantly having sex, there's a pitch-perfect escalation of the types of ludicrously involved and wildly salacious sexual activities that should get old, but it's usually Matt Berry doing it, so it doesn't. Some may quibble that I'm giving the dub to a comedy series, but like, despite being ostensibly a parody, what we do in the shadows, refreshingly, does not deconstruct vampires. It just juxtaposes them with the banality of the modern world for comedic effect. That approach means that the vampires get to be just, like, what you think a vampire should be. It's not modernized, it's not made to be less silly, it's just recontextualized, and that, across the board, makes them extremely strong, Vampiric entries on this list? Well, I don't know what to tell you. Vampire stories these days are like, vampires, but... Vampires, but what if it's a virus you can catch? Vampires, but what if everyone's a vampire? 
vampires, but like they're on a plane or on a boat or on a Brooklyn. This is a group of simple across the plate vampires. So that's what I think. Go ahead and tell me what I missed and what a hack and fraud I am for not putting your favorite vampire on the list. Oh, what about Rick Moranis's Gravedale High? What about Anne Hodgman's seminal series of children's novels, My Babysitter is a Vampire? What about that X-Files episode with the kid from the Big Green where they do a Rashomon? How come you talked about two deeply Canadian things, but not blood and donuts? What about Vampire's Kiss? What about Tales from the Crypt, Bordello of Blood? Have at it, you little freaks. Tell me all the vampires I missed. I dare you. Have a good time. Hello, it's me, the real Count Dracula. I'd like to thank the, my thralls over on patreon.com slash scaredycats, particularly Joe McClory, Liz Widow, Jacob Lancaster, Annabelle, Mastin Ginger, James Garford, Devin Kaler, Spooky Heather Sylvia, Eleanor Harvey, definitely Todd, and Danwich Games. And I, Bobby Duke, the star of the channel, would like to thank these other stars of the channel. Ben Danish, Jay Torney, Hoha, Schadenfraulein, Lanstintine, Rachel Rat, Sirius Bengal, Kato Moore, Carpad, Josh Manez, Hyla Tracy, Louisa Prito, Comrade Rose X, and Jesse uses all stars of the channel. And also, I don't really see what's scary about eating worms. I think that's a normal thing to do because I'm a Baba Duke. In case you didn't get that joke earlier. Hey, my voice sounds weird because Mildo's got a sore throat. What are you gonna do?